then copying that information, like I said, and then inserting that information into the DNA of another organism and growing the new organism. And just kind of some history about GMOs. Genetic manipulation of plants goes back many years. Um, in 1866, y'all might be familiar with this scientist, Gregor with like the yellow and the white flowers. Um, that was kind of the first study of uh, basic genetic traits. But even before that, like using hybrid crops was a practice. So it's been kind of used for a long time. Um, human insulin was the first consumer GMO product in 1982. Um, and GMO crops were first introduced in the United States in the mid 1990s. And the first GMO crop was a tomato in 1994, but GMO tomatoes are not available anymore. So that was just in the 90s, they're no longer available. And then just a little bit about insulin. Most insulin is genetically modified. It has been for a long time. Um, some sources of insulin, bacteria, that's the main source today. Um, you can get large batches from bacteria because there's so much readily available bacteria and it's easy to manipulate. And then previously pigs and cattle were um, genetically modified to produce human insulin, but that practice was stopped in like the early 2000s, I think like 2006 for pigs or maybe it was cattle, but way, way long ago, so. And E. coli is actually the bacteria that's used um, for insulin production. So that's kind of interesting considering how dangerous E. coli can be. Um, GMOs in America, most GMO crops in America are used for animal food. So it's not extremely likely that you're gonna be going to the grocery store and your raw produce you're buying is genetically modified. Um, at least in this way, that's not to say it's not like hybrid or something like that, but one, gene like what they do in genetically technically genetically modified crops um won't be altered um gmos make up a large percentage of all crops grown um most food products you consume contain gmo crop derived ingredients and that would be like cornstarch corn syrup oils and granulated sugar like the things that they need a lot of in food production and stuff like that those are going to be the things that come from genetically modified crops. So these are all of the GMO crops in America. These are the only GMO crops in America and nothing outside of these things um, will be genetically modified. So that'll be corn, soybeans, cotton. Those are the big three um, that make up the most agriculture. Potatoes, papaya, summer squash, canola, alfalfa, apples, and only certain apples. Um, sugar beets and pink pineapples. I think there's maybe one other one like worldwide and it's eggplant, but other than that, there's no other genetically modified crops in the world. Um, so the first one, corn, it's the most commonly grown crop. It's grown in all 50 states. Most GMO corn is created to resist insect pests or tolerate herbicides um, and that there's a type, it's called BT corn, and um, there's BT cotton as well. Um, GMO corn is mainly used for processed foods, like I said, with like cornstarch and stuff like that, um, drinks uh, and livestock feed. And BT corn is GMO corn that produces proteins that are toxic to certain insect pests, but nothing else. And this is just an example um, of what the BT corn looks like in comparison to a non-GMO corn. The top one is um, the BT and the bottom is non-GMO. This was in the Philippines, not the United States, but that's the effects of it, the Asian corn borer over there. So you can see the corn itself looks identical pretty much, but um, the GMO one isn't affected by the corn borer. And soybeans, um, 
most soy in the U.S. is GMO soy. GMO soy is mainly used for livestock feed, ingredients, and processed foods. That would be like lecithin, I think that's how it's pronounced, emulsifiers and proteins, um, and soybean oil. And then cotton, um, it's created to be resistant to bollworms. GMO cotton is mainly used for the textile industry, cottonseed oil, and livestock food. Um, cotton byproducts are popular in beef cattle diets. And then this is a picture of um, the cotton on the left is BT cotton, like the BT corn, it's resistant to pests. And then the cotton on the right is not. And you can see the significant difference. The right cotton has been affected by these pests and the one on the left hasn't. Um, then potatoes, uh, they're developed to resist insect pests and disease and some varieties are developed to resist bruising and browning after being cut. And fresh from the store, these could be GMO, but um, there's actually a list and I'll show it to you as well on the USDA website where you can go through and look at all of the genetically modified crops. And since there's only like 12, 13, it's a pretty short list. You can click on each one and then it lists all the different genetically modified varieties. And you can just like look those up and see where they're commercially available. So. And then this is what they're trying to prevent kind of the bruising and browning after being cut. They want it to look more like that. <laughs> then papayas, um, they're developed to resist ring spot virus. Um, a specific variety that was developed to resist it is the rainbow papaya. GMO um, papayas saved Hawaiian papaya farming. There wouldn't be any papaya farming in Hawaii in Hawaii had there not been um, genetic modification. And then again, fresh from store could be GMO, but it just depends on the variety. So, and I believe the rainbow papaya and there's one other um, variety that's available in stores. And then this is what the ring spot virus looks like. And you can see the actual plant, it just devastates the whole plant. Um, and like I said, the ring spot virus nearly destroyed the Hawaiian um, papaya crop in the 1990s. Then summer squash developed to be resistant to some plant viruses. Summer squash was one of the first GMOs on the market and fresh from store could be GMO. Summer squash production um, is relatively low like for commercial use for the GMO one at least is so. Um, then canola is developed to be resistant to herbicides, helps farmers to more easily control weeds. Um, like you can see it's flowers. So you can imagine all the weeds that kind of get down in that and how hard that would be for farmers to control. So um, the canola being developed to be resistant to those herbicides helps out farmers a lot. Um, GMO canola is mainly used for cooking oil, margarine, and livestock feed. And then alfalfa um, developed to be resistant to herbicides, again, just to help farmers more easily control weeds. Um, GMO alfalfa is mainly used for cattle feed and specifically dairy cows. And then apples. Um, they're developed to resist browning after being cut and fresh from store could be GMO. Um, it's only certain varieties of apples though. They're called Arctic apples um, and they're sold pre-sliced for the most part. From what I can tell, I was kind of researching it a little bit. And I think the only place you can even buy these varieties of apples is like on Amazon Marketplace and a few like grocery stores in Los Angeles, but they're not like you're not going to go to the store and your apple you're buying is going to be the genetically modified apple. But since they're sold pre-cut, they're um, modified to not brown when they're cut. So, and they're only, I think it's only Golden Delicious and Granny Smith are the only two that are sold that way. 
and I'll show you that website too because I also have that pulled up. But um, yeah, anyways, sugar beets are developed to be resistant to herbicides and help farmers more easily control weeds again. Um, GMO sugar beets are mainly used for granulated sugar. More than half of the granulated sugar packets that you'll find in like grocery stores come from GMO sugar beets. And then the last uh, crop in the United States is pink pineapple. It's developed um, to have a pink flesh. That's the only thing. It doesn't have any other thing that it's developed for no pesticide or herbicide benefits, just the pink flesh. Um, and it doesn't change the taste either. From what I can tell, it's just grown to be pink. It's what would be like considered a, a designer fruit, sort of. Um, the pink pineapple has increased levels of lycopene, which is naturally found in pineapples, but they're just increasing that to make it show up the pink pigment. And it gives uh, tomatoes their red color and watermelon their pink color. So, um, and fresh from store, if you buy a pink pineapple, it will be GMO. These aren't natural from the world. They're all genetically modified. And designer fruits are like, hybrid fruits like pluots and like cotton candy grapes. This isn't exactly the same as that because this isn't a hybrid with anything, but um, it's just kind of designed to be pretty. So, and it really is pink. Like this is really what it looks like. That isn't mm -hmm. modified or edited at all. Mm -hmm. So it really looks that way. And some of them are even more pink and vibrant than that, so. And then crop yield, um, G, genetically modified technology is found to increase crop yields by 21%. Um, this was a study. Um, it was called a meta-analysis of the impacts of genetically modified crops. And I found it on the National Library of Medicine. But um, that increase is just due to more effective pest control and lower crop damage. Um, these crops aren't being modified to produce a higher genetic yield potential or anything like that. This is just because pests aren't getting to these crops and there's not any damage going on. And then this was a, a graph from that study. You can see the yield was increased um, by 21.6%. And then pesticide quantity and pesticide costs are both down um, almost 40% for both of those. And then total production cost is 3.3%. And then farmer profit, you can see, is way above everything else at 68.2%. Then animal consumption. Um, more than 95% of animals used for meat and dairy in the United States eat GMO crops. Like I said, most of these things are being produced for livestock feed, like the corn, um, soybeans, things like that. Um, the DNA in GMO food does not transfer to the animals that eat it, so there's no reported difference in how GMO and non-GMO foods affect animals, like there's no difference that's been observed thus far, um, and animals that consume GMO foods are not in turn GMOs just because they don't absorb those genetic traits or anything like that, like that DNA is not being transferred to that animal. So just because they consume those things that doesn't make them um, GMO. And then these are some GMO animals that are available on the market. The gall safe or gal safe pig isn't um, available right now, but it's approved. So it could be available in the coming years, but um, the aqua advantage salmon, um, it reaches uh, an important growth point faster, so it just gets bigger faster. Um, and then the gal safe pig is free of alpha gal sugar, and people with alpha gal syndrome may have an allergic reaction to that sugar. So, this is an option for those people to be able to eat um, like pork. Um, gal, alpha gal syndrome is just a red meat allergy. So, um, this is a step to allow those people that are allergic to red meat to be able to consume red meat. But like I said, that one isn't commercially available right now from what I can tell, but it should be 
in the coming years. I think it was approved in 2020 or 2021. So, and I'll show you that website I was talking about with, um, well, maybe I will. I forgot it's pulled up on mine. I'll tell you what it's called at least. Um, it's just the USDA, um, just a list of bioengineered foods. And when you go on there, it's just, I can send this out as well. I'll stop sharing my screen. But, um, yeah, it's just a list and it has all these crops that I mentioned. It has some, it has um, the, the Aqua Vantage salmon on there. The Gal Safe pig isn't on there, but I think that's because it's not commercially available yet. But once it is, um, they'll update that and add it on there as well. But you can find all the review information and um, what all the different genetically modified versions of everything are called on there. So it's a good resource to have if you're concerned about GMOs or if you want to limit your consumption of GMOs. So yeah, that was my last slide. Do y'all have any questions or anything you want to add? Any concerns y'all have about genetically modified products? Um, uh, the 95% of animals that are used for food mm -hmm. get GMO modified uh, food. Yeah, they get the food. Yeah, but it didn't. It doesn't transfer to us. No, because um, just it's just the DNA in their food is being altered, and they're consuming that. But they're not like absorbing those genetic traits or the DNA or anything like that. They're just absorbing the protein and the things that benefit them, not the DNA. So it doesn't transfer over to us when we consume it. Anybody else got anything? That's a good question. That's why I kind of included that in there because a lot of people do believe that it's- Because that's the kind of thing that we think yeah. about and worry about. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, a valid thing to be concerned about, you know, so. One of the effects of eating GMO food itself on humans. Um. I mean, if you consume GMO food. I don't think it's kind of the same as like, um, like the livestock, like there's not any reported effects of GMOs on people. Like everything is approved to be safe for human consumption and compared to like the non-GMO things before they're approved. And all of that information is also included on the crop reports on that website that I was talking about, so. So eating eating an ear of corn, it doesn't. Yeah, no, it's okay. not going to transfer any of like the modified DNA to you. So. I think in Europe and UK they are very strict about consuming GMO foods. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know what to eat them. More than more than here. Much more. Than here. Hmm. Yeah, when I was reading, um, these genetically modified crops, they're mostly like. We're the biggest GMO producer like in the world. Yeah. I think it's like 40% of all GMOs come from here. But um, other countries do produce, produce GMOs as well, just not on the same large scale that we do. But our agriculture is so robust and active here. So um, I think that's why it's larger scale here from what I could tell. But yeah, Dr. Veda is right. There's not as many GMOs in like European countries and yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's it's a thing of personal choice and this is why knowing the facts about it is important so you can make that choice for yourself and your family and be conscious of what you're purchasing and consuming and stuff. So anybody else got anything? I, I didn't know about the gall safe pig. I know it's not about the gall syndrome. Alpha gall syndrome. One of the ways you get that in the way this guy got it is the, the long star ticks. Mm -hmm. you get 
you know, that they okay. transferred. So he can't even credit me. I just want mm -hmm. to be known as a fucking gone safe pick. Yeah, I think they distributed like some of it when they approved it. I don't know. I was kind of reading because I was trying to see if it was available anywhere right now, and I don't think it is. But since it was so recently approved, I guess they just haven't moved it onto the market yet. Because it takes a few years. For yeah, things. yeah. The process of getting a GMO approved, I think I was reading, takes like at least seven years, if not more. So it's a pretty long process, at least in the United States. So, of course, you're also dealing with government, which is slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like it's all through the government. It's the FDA, USDA, um, EPA, a little bit too. A lot of government agencies. So um, I really didn't know a whole lot about GMOs before kind of researching and making this presentation. It's really an interesting thing, especially that website with all the different crops and stuff. It's really interesting to go through. So. Those who advocate GMO foods, um, uh, I mean, the use of GMO, really argue that without GMO, the world will have a famine. Yeah. And there won't be enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the, the uh, that there won't be enough food to eat. The comparison pictures are, are dramatic. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from just how much of the GMO food is used in agriculture for livestock. Because yeah. if you aren't able to feed the livestock, then you're not going to get your beef, your poultry, your, you know, your whatever. So I think that's where most of that concern comes from, at least in the United States. Because like other countries aren't on as big of a scale with GMO as we are. So and and that feed would be for everybody, not just the big producers, not just the big cattle farms or whatever, but just a farmer who has a cow. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that, actually. I didn't look into that aspect of it. From what I understood, it was mostly large scale. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that small scale isn't also, you know, getting these feeds too. So that would be something that I would look into more. I know one thing is that you mentioned the, the herbicide resistant crops, like uh, there's Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready alfalfa. Mm -hmm. There's some out Roundup Ready alfalfa being grown uh, okay. within within an hour, within a mile of here, uh, and you know that's that's being fed to lot the livestock, and that's yeah. Uh, mm. that's, mm. that's there was another Roundup Ready variety of something I was looking at on that website. It might have been. It wasn't corn because there's a lot of genetically modified corn varieties. It was something else. It might have been soybeans, maybe. I don't know. But there's more genetically modified varieties of corn, I believe, than any other crop. So I, I know that when I was in Kentucky, one of my vegetable growers who he had a market he'd sell from, from his farm on the side of the road. And one of the seed companies had a, an experimental Roundup Ready sweet corn because it's usually feed corn. He, he bought the seed and he, he planted it and it was, I, I ate some of it. It was, I mean, it was, it was just fine. He, he, he did sell some of it. Mm. Yeah. It's but there's no way you can look on whatever you're about to buy. I mean, if, if you're a, if you have one cow and you're buying feed, can you look on the bag at, I at think, the tractor supply? I think since like 2016, they passed um, a law that requires like manufacturers of these things. I'm not sure about like in that case where it's kind of like a, not the main, well. Just regular. Yeah, just like regular, regular consumer, consumer products. I think they're required to disclose if it's bioengineered or not mm -hmm. from what I could understand. And I'm, I'm sure that would be the case with feed too. Or I feel like they would probably know what they're getting into with the feed situation just because it's so like common now to use GMO in feed. Yeah, it's so, been in the news enough that anybody, everybody should be, you know, yeah. aware of it, whatever. Yeah. If they want to ask questions, they yeah. have to ask questions. But I believe just like commercially and like buying your stuff from the store, like they're required to say whether or not it's genetically modified or not. So and that's a fairly new development. Like I said, 2016, I believe, is when that went into effect. So, 
Yeah. A lot of things surrounding it. It's a very in-depth topic. When, when Chloe said she was going to work on this topic, I told her a story. I got yelled at once at the GMO presentation. It was a master gardener who yelled at this was in Kentucky. And, and I had given an example of one of the companies was doing a, a rice that had beta carotene, had a gene added, added beta carotene. And what they were looking at is, is in uh, countries where they eat a lot of rice, but they have a lot of childhood blindness. The beta carotene would be in the rice and you know, it would prevent that blindness. And she, she got really offended over, over that. But uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty hot topic. And it's, it's, it's a pretty hot topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the first ones the the herbicide used was the Roundup ready glyphosate. Yeah, that's and, and the Roundup ready corn right. is actually very like always been very common. I mean, it's used in, in the BT corn. I've seen more and more of that being used. But it's it's concerning in a way. Uh, the BT the, the, stands for what? Bacillus. The, bacillus. Thuringiensis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the things that you don't know, because my chemistry teacher out at the college here had worked for Monsanto, his first job for Monsanto. So he knew some things that you don't ordinarily get to know. So mm -hmm. occasionally he dropped little uh, concerning. You really yeah. don't know what Monsanto is. For yeah, reason. of course, Monsanto, I no, think, I has know. been. Has, that is the biggest I, argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really don't know no, is really the thing don't. like this is the facts about it but you really don't know no, no. so that's why it's important to know but also do your own research and know your own things and do what's best for you mm -hmm. yeah my mom she's very much no gmo she got i believe i don't know some kind of seed for corn and it was for like milling, like for flour, I guess, or cornmeal, I don't know. But um, she was all about, oh, this is no GMO. Blah, blah. But no non-GMO corn is very hard to get. Mm -hmm. And I was telling her like, are you sure? Are you sure it's not GMO? But I don't know. <laughs> She's trying, so that's good, I guess. <laughs> So that's the label that you're seeing all over the place now. It's no GMOs. Because that's all the labels that you see lately now. That no GMOs, no GMOs. Yeah, that's another thing. Um, I can kind of mention all these labels that say no GMOs are like on these fruits. They say no GMO. A lot of things that they're putting that label on already <laughs> aren't GMO. So they're kind of putting double, that double. Yeah, they're kind of putting that label on there to make you think, oh, there's GMO varieties of this that I've been buying to kind of encourage you, oh, if you don't want GMOs, buy my product. Uh -huh. But it's actually not GMO at all ever anywhere. It's so, a marketing thing. Yeah, it's a marketing thing. So there's a we have so the Power River Project, a GMO American chestnut is developed by, by Sunni. Uh, and it has a, a wheat gene spliced into it. So it it it's the American chestnut, but it has that wheat gene, so it's resistant to the fly. Mm -hmm. But the research, what, since it, since people are nervous about GMOs, they're just going to watch and see how it survives and how it grows for a few years, and they'll destroy it before it ever produces pollen. But uh, you know, that's another uh, non-food way that, that GMOs are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, like these are the crops that are like GMO certified in the United States, but you've still got like your hybrid fruits, like I was talking about, like the pluots and like cotton candy grapes and different varieties. So that's another way of something being genetically modified, I guess, just not in the same way as these things are. Like you're not manipulating one certain trait and changing it in those other hybrid things like you are in these. So the cotton candy grapes are genetically modified? Not technically, they're a hybrid of like two varieties of grapes, but they're not isolating like a single yeah. genetic trait and changing it. But they're crossbreeding those grapes together to get the, the cotton the candy grape. Apple varieties that uh, which does not uh, discolor when you cut it mm -hmm. 
I, I noticed they are available in Washington State. Oh, really? Yeah, they are mm -hmm. heavy in the grocery stores. Hmm. Well, I think it, it seems to be kind of a, like a West Coast thing from yeah. what I could tell, because like those Amazon Marketplace stores, I believe there is I one. I happen to notice that because I told you I recently went to right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, I was going to so, say, I believe uh, there's so one of those in stores in Seattle. I was noticing that the apples mm -hmm. they were using, when you cut it, it doesn't get discolored. So I looked at the varieties that was being sold at Kroger there. Kroger what, what was what was the variety? I, I wrote it down. I don't have the. But it was not not what you're used to. No, not not a variety you were used to. I would assume it would be the Arctic Apple brand. Oh, it might. Because I think, from what I could tell, that's, that's the one, one. That's the one that's being genetically modified to not brown when you cut it. So, I believe. But they, I talked a little bit more about it. They claim that it is a variety of apple from New Zealand. Hmm. Oh. That, so it, that it's could not be genetically modified. It's a variety of apple. From New so that could be the thing about it. It's not genetically modified, but it's not from here. So that also makes sense. Hmm. hmm. That's really neat that they're kind of going around that genetic modification thing <laughs> and they're importing it from somewhere else but it's not genetically modified that's mm. interesting mm. okay mm. then it wouldn't be the arctic apple because that's a united states yeah, thing right. so well washington state is one of the biggest apple growers yes anyhow. it is mm -hmm. eastern, eastern, part. Eastern, it's part. The eastern part very interesting 